Hey everyone, I'm really excited to show off this interview slash just casual discussion I got to have with Peter Barber. He's a really great guy, really considerate and kind, and we talked a bit on Avatar The Last Airbender, which is a show that both of us really just appreciate, and talked a lot about music and opera and the scene itself, and it was very enriching and insightful, and I loved having that discussion. That being said, I need to give a few disclaimers before jumping into this video. The first being, before actually recording the interview, I checked the audio and visual software and formatting and everything was working fine. And then after the interview had ended, when I was editing it, everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. The audio was a nightmare. The visuals were a nightmare. And on top of it, during the interview itself, and this is absolutely my fault, I just wasn't aware that Zoom had a 40 minute time limit per call. So in the middle of the interview, I had to make an awkward cut because of the time limit that was running out. And also there's going to be a couple of pop-ups in the interview as well that show, hey, your time is running out, you need to upgrade or whatever. And it was really frustrating to work around and in terms of the audio and visuals, I did everything I could. This was a very challenging editing project that I tried to do on this. I think the actual content of the video is still worthwhile, still insightful, and I still had a really good time with it. And honestly, I would love the opportunity to talk with Peter again, hopefully this time. I'm not only going to be a little bit more prepared, but actually have equipment that doesn't <laughs> fail me <laughs> in the moments that I need them to work. So with all of that said, I sincerely appreciate your patience throughout the interview, and I sincerely hope that you enjoy the content of the interview despite the technical problems that I, that I encountered. So with all that said, please enjoy the actually just really comfortable, casual discussion I got to have with Peter. Hey everyone, good evening. I'm really excited to have Peter Barber here on the show or interview or whatever you want to call it. And we're just going to be talking about music and anything outside of that. It's going to be structured kind of like an interview, but just more be just casual dialogue ultimately. And I'm really excited to jump into this. So thank you so much for being here, honestly. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat about opera and YouTube and whatever else comes up. Yeah. So tell me what got you into music and opera as a whole. Music started from a very, very, very young age, as young as I can remember, really. Uh, my whole mom's side is very musical. My mom was a classical cellist, actually. Oh, awesome. My aunt played violin. My All my cousins pretty much could play instruments. Um, so it was always around, especially family gatherings. Uh, dad's side, not musical at all big supporters of my career, but not not musical people inherently. Um, so I was kind of exposed to it from a really early age. I mean, as far as singing, I was doing I was singing all the Disney stuff, right? So I would, watch, I would watch Beauty and the Beast and sing all the parts. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> which which works best when you're doing Belle when she's going through town. Yeah. Um, so especially as I've, Gaston. Especially, and of course, from a young age, I loved Gaston because he was muscular and had a super low voice. Of course. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, and also a phenomenal, like, legit opera singer in the original cast. I was. Richard White. Yeah. I mean, that that's a great baritone voice. Loved imitating him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it started from a very young age, but really, all the way through high school, uh, I was all about sports. So I did some musical things. My mom kind of strong armed me into a jazz singing group and I did some band here and there and I did an auditioned choir my senior year but I had like I wanted to go to college for sports mm -hmm. um, so I really didn't consider music certainly not as a professional option mm -hmm. um, until I ended up going to undergrad for voice uh, I went to the University of Miami uh, nice. for vocal performance for a couple years was totally overwhelmed by opera and language and mm -hmm. diction and ear training and all these things I didn't think a second about as a as an athlete <laughs> in high school <laughs> um, and so I actually pulled away from opera switched to music production learned how to use all the recording software produce albums I was in school in Miami so electronic music was huge there yeah um, 
transferred to James Madison University, kept up with music production. And then right at the end of my undergrad, because I had continued taking voice lessons and such, that was still my primary instrument technically, even though I was a music production major. I did, so I was still doing the operas on occasion. Mm -hmm. And my last year of undergrad, they wanted me to do Don Alfonso and Così Fan Tutte. Yeah. And that role, I had so much fun even preparing that role, but that that whole mm. experience was so fun that it brought me back to the opera world from the music production composition world. Right on. So I ended up going to my master's for voice and then did an artist diploma for voice and have been singing fully professionally for a few years now. Right on. So when you were doing vocal jazz, how would you compare vocal jazz with with opera because when I was trying vocal jazz and just learning the fundamentals of just scatting as a whole, I found that to be considerably more challenging to get the rudiments of than than opera, which sounds jazz a little is, weird. Jazz is extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think how you can obviously train both. I think some people are more geared for one, probably more than the other. Mm. In a way that's, I mean, like, it's similar in a way to opera where you can be pretty good at singing a lot of different genres and a lot of different languages, but you're probably only going to be really good at like one, like mm -hmm. that you can really make a career out of. Yeah. Um, you have to be specialized. You can't be the best at everything. Right. right? But jazz was difficult. And again, I did not care about <laughs> music or singing at the time. I cared about track and football. Mm -hmm. And so I would show up to these, these jazz rehearsals and I had basically forgotten how to read music from when I played trombone in middle school. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing everything by ear. And it was a major struggle. And also, I was singing bass, but I wasn't a real bass at the time. Yeah. I very much, you know how some people start out as like a low bass in high school and their voice goes up as they train? Yeah. That's like a pretty normal thing, especially in opera. Mine was totally the opposite, which is I very much started out as a baritone and have just over the last. 15 years just continued to get lower and lower um <laughs> impressive i've always wanted that for myself but i just kind of <laughs> stayed at baritone which is fine i love being a baritone but yeah there's so many roles you can sing as baritone mm. um so yeah jazz is extremely difficult and i was really just flying by the seat of my pants the mm -hmm. whole time <laughs> you know fair <laughs> um so what was what was your training like when you actually committed to being an opera singer? Like transitioning yeah. from sports and having that kind of sports mentality. Because as someone who also engaged with sports, but also put all of my mental faculties into, like I have an older sister and she went into college for opera. And when I was young and I didn't even know that that was a possibility. So I'm like, I'm just going to devote my entire life to getting into school for opera. And then I did, and I graduated, and I went out into Los Angeles, started performing for companies and things like that. But ultimately, uh, it just took up so much of my my time working with just a couple of teachers and just driving as much competition or as many competitions as I can get into and auditioning for many schools. So what was your what was your training like and what was your experience with getting into music? Yeah, just just to piggyback off that for a second, mm. opera is incredibly time consuming. Oh, and demanding. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, the, vo the vocal technique takes forever and most people never get that good at it. Honestly, languages take forever and most people never get that good at it. Just the diction. Act Diction, yeah. acting, learning how to sing with orchestra, learning. I mean, there are just a million things that take so long yeah. to get down. Absolutely. So, all to say, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the training started. So because my mom had a partially classical background in cello before my senior year of high school, she encouraged me to take a few voice lessons with a guy at University of Virginia because she noticed that my voice was just it was lower and louder naturally yeah which and like you can do so much to your voice with training but to be a pro, to be a pro opera singer you've got to have some genetic gifts like i you agree have to, you have to be loud yeah period i agree like, 
we sing without microphones with a full orchestra in a big space. Yes. You need to be loud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't agree with you more. <laughs> Which, by the way, is my elevator pitch for people who don't really know about opera. Is mm. That's the first thing I say. No microphones, full orchestra, big space. Absolutely. You got to be hollering. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I took a few voice lessons with this guy at University of Virginia. And he was the one that was like, you know, you should really consider doing this in college like mm. there's clearly some gifts there that you could you could see expressed um and again that was that was when i was all sports i was like oh, i'm going to college for sports like mm. <laughs> i'm not interested in this sure um but i did end up applying to a few music schools and so the training once i got there which i think is how it is for all undergrads is you have your weekly voice lesson this is before you even start coaching yeah which there's a difference, people, between voice lessons and vocal coaching. Yes. Which we can get into, which we can get into. <laughs> <laughs> there absolutely is. There absolutely is. So it was lessons. It was ear training at 8 a.m. It was piano, like like basic piano classes. Mm -hmm. It was diction classes. I think it was singing in the opera chorus for Magic Flute my freshman year. Oh, that's a fun it opera. It was doing like little arias and art songs. And mm -hmm. like, I don't even think I did an opera scene as like a principal until I was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. um, but it was all it was all those things. It was all the fundamentals that you need <clears throat> to start getting your vocal training going. Um, and even when I transferred to JMU and switched to music production, because voice was still my my principal instrument um even though i was working with production software and stuff like that i was still doing all those things at james madison so i was producing the studio stuff and working on electronic music but i was still taking voice lessons which i skipped a lot because i didn't <laughs> give a shit <laughs> i really didn't start caring about voice until towards that last year of undergrad. I was like, oh, I have my senior recital coming up. I should probably not suck. <laughs> Did you have juries or like approval? Yeah, yeah I had juries yeah. and I and I, I wung it every time. <laughs> I, I, I would be, be a week out from juries having skipped most of my voice lessons for the semester. Impressive. And I would just be like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to just live in the library, memorize my translations, go to the practice room and just figure out how to sing these these arias <laughs> badly and then and then get through it and so i was really i was really riding on that little bit of talent i had all the way until i prepped for my senior recital mm -hmm. and i was like wow i really get better when i practice this is amazing <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> <laughs> so that was my whole that was how my training was throughout throughout undergrad and as you know as you go up the levels you just you just train harder and like really dialing in what it takes to to keep jumping to the next level, which yeah. gets more and more difficult and more and more people fall off, mm -hmm. um, understandably. And if you don't have the genetic gifts that gets exposed, like I remember working with singers, even on the young artist level, mm -hmm. even so, even sometimes I would say on the on the professional level where they've got really wonderful technique, they sound phenomenal, but they just don't make much noise. And yeah. so because of that, and there's nothing wrong with this, and this is mm -hmm. fantastic. It's fantastic to have a career working regionally or working in smaller companies or working in Europe where the houses are all much smaller. Absolutely. Fantastic. That's like all I want to do really for a while. Like I don't mm -hmm. really have an interest in the big houses now. Yeah. I'm, um, the, I'm but, the same way. Yeah. Yeah. But some, but some people just, they just don't have the natural setup to, to be a principal in a big house, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is really, really fascinating actually mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's that's how that's how the training went and i can talk more about the training at usc versus the training at the academy of vocal arts versus working with arizona opera or wherever you can just let me know where you want to take it yeah so like just for just for context i i started i started my undergrad at cal state northridge and when i was applying to universities uh the school that i wanted to go to was chapman university and I got accepted and they gave me a scholarship, but it was still too expensive to go. So I went to a local state university where the music department was still fine. And I was shocked to hear the myriads of different types of voices that I heard from very loud, but extremely rapid vibratos from sopranos, from sopranos and tenors. Um, I heard some... We only had a couple basses and bass baritones at the 
at the school because of the just it being a more rare voice type and they were the most popular kids in the department uh there there's just an intrinsic sexiness that comes with bass notes um yeah and you can be really bad as yes. a bass in undergrad and still get roles <laughs> exactly that was me <laughs> like <laughs> What I've noticed is that for every 10 women, there's one man, regardless of whatever your voice type is. In the um, undergrad, for sure. It's about yeah. right. But as I was going through the program and I started realizing like how intense some of my professors were in terms of this is harmony, this is counterpoint, this is musical analysis, and so, even the musical prodigies in the class, like piano performance majors and all of these people couldn't finish the finals because they were just that intense um and when it came down to times for for figuring out like okay it's time to start doing roles i actually started doing roles when i was a when i was a freshman uh and i started as morales in carmen and that's even though morales is a small role that's really young to be doing a role of any kind i was very pleasantly shocked especially since my audition went terribly <laughs> um but <Hey> guys <laughs> exactly but uh the voice department said that even though the audition itself didn't go well that they heard my natural resonance they heard uh mm. i also i'm very in terms of the level of acting and this is a problem that i actually have in a lot of big opera houses is that they don't act. They're more just standing, focusing so primarily on technique and the sound that I'm not really getting a lot of real interpersonal engagement with the other characters. And and when I see opera, I wanna see not just, I don't wanna just hear beautiful music, but I wanna see real connection happening between characters. And yeah. that's something that I really loved doing on stage. So what? So what is it you mentioned earlier about acting itself? What is it about the hand in hand between acting and music that compelled you to keep engaging with with opera? Yeah, opera and acting and opera is very interesting, um, and it's changed so much over the last century. Yeah, um, I mean, like it really used to be park and bark, and no one cared. And some of the best voices ever were doing that, right? Yeah, in the, absolutely. In the, in the golden age. And then we started getting more media to the point of the Met Live in HD, mm -hmm. where you're not just doing, you can't, you're not just acting for a big opera stage where all the gestures are completely overdone because you have to do that for the person in the back to see it. Mm -hmm. But it's in, it's in here too. And so yeah. there's, so opera singers used to not really act at all. They pretty much did it all with their voices, like you said, and you could mm. you could hear more about what they were doing on recordings. You could there were like more vocal colors and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, nowadays, there's much more pressure on acting, but there's still the gold standard of singing a certain way. So there's so much demand for modern opera singers to really be doing it all, like singing at the highest level and acting really well in case there's a camera in your face. And that's that's really tough. I mean, I can say for sure, as I've gone through my progression, there's there's been more and more push to have more acting training in the institutions. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of heavy acting workshops with a wonderful guy named Paul Curran when I was at the Academy of Vocal Arts. He would come in for like two weeks and we would just hours a day just be drilling acting exercises and really getting real and making it feel organic which is another really tough thing with opera because you're singing in a foreign language and you've got to know the translations perfectly and mm -hmm. you've got to think about the technique and you got to connect with the conductor and like how do you do all that and still act organically absolutely um i mean it basically all has to be muscle memory you've just got yeah. you just you gotta, gotta rehearse, drill it you gotta drill it and drill it and drill it and that's really the that's like the long story short for opera in general it's just like <laughs> how do you memorize a 400 page opera score it's like, well, you just spend a lot of time <laughs> like every waking moment for a couple months and then it'll be in there. <laughs> exactly. Like that. I I actually got that a lot when I finished performances and I had people asking me 
how do you remember all of this stuff and still know what it is you're acting when you don't even speak the language? And it's just, you spend hours translating it, you spend hours with the diction, you spend hours memorizing it. So that way, when you actually start rehearsals, that all of that is just second nature, that you don't commit any of your mental faculties to that because you know you can just depend on yourself to do it so you can actually focus on the yeah. acting, the staging, the things like that. Yeah. yeah, there's no, there's, there are definitely, everyone, everyone studies in a different way, right? You got to mm -hmm. find your way that where you memorize music and words and text the best, get mm -hmm. your tools, toolkit together. But there's, there's no substitution for just time studying. Absolutely. Deep work, like you have to put in deep work on the score. Um, and then to add to all the, that long list, you just riddled off about how to memorize a role. As you, as you go up in levels, undergrad, masters, arts diploma, young artist, professional, mm. you coach, you coach it deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. So like in Aspen this past summer, we did Marriage of Figaro and I was just oh, doing great. Antonio. I yeah. just did a, vir I didn't even do a virtual audition for them. I just submitted pre-screenings and they were generous enough to grant me a spot in the Renee Fleming studio without oh. singing for them live. Which Congratulations. Was That's awesome. Um, so the coaches there, I mean, we have one of the, the head of music for Opera Philadelphia was there working <laughs> always in the room. Um, Nicola, who works at the Met, mm -hmm. yeah, full time at the Met as the Italian coach was there coaching our Italian. That's awesome. And you're doing and every day you have and now my role wasn't that big. So I didn't have that much of it. But every day you're coaching these roles with like really high level coaches. Mm. And if you do that, like, so for example, I just I just sang Mazzetto and covered Leporello at Arizona Opera. Oh, I loved Which performing is, Leporello. He's such a fun character. That's one of the best, He's such, one of the best roles ever. Yeah, period. absolutely. And that's a and that's a big one. It is. It is. Big one. It's a Probably just tasks. as much as Giovanni himself. You listed off a bunch of things it takes to prep a role. Yeah. And for a role like, and as you go up, the, I was saying, as you go up the tiers of performance, the demand for coaching and specificity gets higher and higher and higher so like i remember when i did my first role ever this is insane i did uh bartolo and barbara seville oh you as your first role my first role oh my gosh you role. Oh so God. much italian yeah i was miserable that whole semester doing it because i didn't know how to prepare pre prepare a role and that's a huge one yeah um, and vocally, it was it was insanely hard yeah, for me at the time. I mean, it, it would still it would still be hard to sing. Yeah, quite frankly, that role is brutal. Mm -hmm. um, and so you and and I remember like like I said earlier, there was no coaching at that point. It was just your weekly voice lesson and rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And so we got a little bit of Italian coaching from the conductor, but like I didn't go through page by page, note note by note, with a vocal coach. And like have that role really dialed in right which is what you do when you get to a certain point like i was mentioning about these coaches in aspen like they are looking at the role from every angle these people that work at really high level opera houses and scrutinizing everything mm -hmm. right so it's not just learning it and prepping it it's like learning it prepping it and then dialing every knob to where it's as polished as it can possibly be uh, which takes you know five, 10 times the amount of work of just learning it, which is already a huge undertaking. Absolutely. Um, so that's a really interesting, interesting thing. So you, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, because, because this was such a huge role and you were new to kind of engaging with this level of work that goes into it, uh, how did you start managing your, your self-critic? Because every single, every single artist has their own worst critic every well every human being is their own worst critic i feel just on a general level um so how do you how do you manage that how do you temper that throughout the course of your career was it more intense in the beginning and then you managed it or did it just keep that same level of intensity which you found ways to ultimately serve to your growth or how, yeah. how did it work yeah, good question. Uh, it's definitely gone through an evolution big time. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, I thought I was a perfect singer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> I got to my freshman year of college and I was like, I'm so good at opera. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel that. <laughs> I was so I was invincible. I felt invincible at the time, mm. and I was horrible. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the average person wouldn't say that, but I can certainly say that looking back at me with no technique versus 12 years of training or whatever, however long it's been. Yeah. Terrible. Absolutely horrendous. <laughs> Absolutely everything, you know? Um, but at the time, I thought it was great. And then mm -hmm. I started getting better, especially, I would say, like when I really started working for my senior recital mm -hmm. and I started practicing, I started getting better, but I started realizing more and more how good the greats were and how far away that gap was between me and like a Samuel Ramey. Absolutely. You yeah. know, at the time. And yeah, it's the almost better striking you... seeing that. Sure. And the more you train and the better you get, the more you appreciate how great those singers were. Absolutely. Now I have a pretty objective measure of like where I am versus where I want to improve because mm -hmm. I've spent so many years working with these great coaches and teachers and dialing everything in. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my own self-critic, yeah, I mean, I obviously, I mean, I'll hold myself to an extremely high standard with everything. You know, you sing through an aria and one note's not quite right. And you're like, <laughs> Could have done that better. Yeah. And if it's not that, it's something else. So you do mm -hmm. you do have to let go of the perfection thing. I have gotten better at that for sure. Like if I give if I give a really good acting performance and I'm really committed to the role, but my voice wasn't quite there that day, I'm okay with that. I'm like, you know what? I really committed to the character and that's gonna be there. And then at some point, you're gonna have a career day and the voice is gonna be totally lined up and you're gonna have a great acting performance and like this guy's going to open and the angels are going to start singing, you know, yes. we're always working towards that. Um, I would say the, the, the thing I struggle with most in terms of being a self critic is just comparing myself to success of others. Um, because I have found a lot of success and what people would call success in mm -hmm. opera on YouTube with the bass gang, all these things are going really, really well. And they're mm -hmm. all trending every day in the right direction yeah congrats. But i still thank you man thank you um but i will still compare myself to the charismatic voices who's a, a dear friend of mine and we've done videos together at this point but elizabeth mm -hmm. has like an empire on yeah. youtube yeah I mean, I've, I've, like, I've noticed <laughs> she is like she is the one for the reaction and analysis sphere that we're both in mm -hmm. And she's got an entire team on her side, like a legal team and all those other oh. things. And it's this whole, whole operation. Uh -huh. And so I look at her and I'm like, oh, well, I'm not doing as well as that. Mm -hmm. But then I also have gotten much better at thinking about things on a much longer time horizon. Mm -hmm. So not thinking about what can what can I do in the next month? But like if if I keep grinding like I'm grinding for the next five, 10 years, what's it going to look like? And that's a much mm -hmm. more exciting thing there's this fantastic tony robbins quote um that's people people drastically overestimate what they can do in a year and drastically underestimate what they can do in a decade absolutely and it's, and it's so true and it's more and more true the more we all get sucked into the short form content and sucked into social media that's this instant gratification and then something like a career in opera starts to seem real crazy because you're thinking about decades yeah like, oh, I can't sing King Philip and Don Carlo right now, but it's my dream to be singing that role professionally when I'm 45. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's going to take a while to actually get your voice up to, yeah. up to that level. And that's uh, a crazy concept in today's society, thinking about what am I going to be doing in 10 to 20 years and planning for that and staying on that path all the way there. People yeah. just don't do that anymore. That's, yeah. You know? That's part of the reason why I do think some of the best singers ever were those golden age opera singers, where they were just working on their voice and opera every day for hours. They weren't distracted by having a website or having to be on Instagram or having to do all these online auditions. They were just getting better at singing. Yeah. When, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you really sit down with your craft because you genuinely love it. And this was like, 2020 was all of the theaters shut down and I had to stop performing live for that time. But that actually gave me a time to sit down with myself and sit down with what my relationship was with the opera scene, which mm -hmm. was I genuinely loved going out on stage, 
taking all of my years of performance, competitions, everything that I've cultivated and giving that to an audience because I really loved making music. I really loved performing and I loved sharing that with others. And the more that I analyzed my relationship with the opera scene, the more, and, and especially the more that I was talking to the casting director of the Met, the casting director of LA Opera, and them talking about all of the, like what a lot of the, the drama and nuances of, all of the behind the scenes stuff uh, and, you know, working at LA Opera is 70% of your income. The the 30% is performing other operas and having your own voice studio and your side hustles. And you're already putting in 14, 16 hours a day at <laughs> the opera if you have a lead role. So it's it's a combination of just completely taking over your life alongside the incredible amounts of nepotism and this cutthroat attitude of i need to step on you to get these roles and and the this kind of environment and i and while that isn't everywhere for sure there's de absolutely a lot of people who genuinely love opera because it's a beautiful art uh but i was able to kind of step back from that and like i was mentioning earlier just doing either small operas or just doing personal recitals and just being able to express art in a way that's really beautiful. That's actually how this channel was born, just because I really love storytelling and I just wanted to be able to express that love to an audience, not because I necessarily want to make this the biggest thing in the world, even though that would be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would, like, I just love expressing that art in the only way you can actually get to that long-term goal to get to that perfect or near perfect i should say because it's always unattainable uh that level of true excellence in a particular role or, or anything it's you really just got to sit down with it because you really love it you know and you have, do have to yeah. need it i mean for opera specifically and to yeah. piggyback off some other things, yeah, the opera world can be very toxic and very challenging mentally and emotionally um, from so many angles. And I, I won't, we won't go into all that here, mm -hmm. but there are, there are certainly a lot of toxic things about the opera world. And there are a lot of beautiful things. Absolutely. Like you mentioned. Now, I went to the Academy of Vocal Arts. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know about ABA, but it, is, no it, in passing. it is notoriously um a very tough place to be mentally because the coaches are really hard and the maestro is the hardest by far i've ever worked with the our the head of music there hard he's how? been there over he's been there over 50 years oh he was a repertor at la scala for when he was younger and then went to aba and he's been there for over 50 years and he has coached every because so many major opera singers have come out of aba mm -hmm. Like it is, it is that it's like that institution where it's like, I don't know if you know, I don't know if you keep up with who's big in opera, but like mm -hmm. Michael Fabiano went there, Stephen Costello went there, yeah. Brian Emel went there, Angela mm -hmm. Mead went there. Oh. Like that, they were all there together, just that class. That's like one class of ABA. Mm -hmm. So it's this institution that has like the highest of high standards. So it is absolutely brutal. Yeah mentally to be there because the coaches hold you to that standard yeah but a blessing and if a you curse. if you if yeah if you can develop thick skin which i really did by my third year there mm. then it becomes the greatest training institution in the world for opera period mm. yeah and there are some and there are some people that absolutely thrive there and there are some people that really crash and burn at that place yeah um and so that is one side of it. It's just like the standard for perfection. And like I was touching on earlier, there's always been a standard for perfection for singing, but it's really new to have a standard of perfection for acting, which is what all these admins and casting people want to see in your audition. Absolutely. You know, they want you to really be the whole package. Um, and it's mm -hmm. tough. I mean, just developing the technique is something very few people, you know, get good enough to do on a pro level. Yeah. Much less the acting and all the rest of it, right? It's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen overnight. Again, long time horizon. Mm -hmm. You can't think I'm going to have the perfect technique next year. It's like, 
gets longer and then your voice goes through biological changes and you refine it and then mm -hmm. it goes through changes again and you refine it you are always learning and always polishing and always perfecting yeah right? absolutely like i was really sh what just going to a state university i didn't think that it was going to be as hard as it was but some of the some of the professors whether it was the top choral professor or even some of my actual class professors like for musicianship and harmony uh, analysis the the standards and expectations they had to say that if i gave them 60 seconds worth of uh, sheet music that i had written for say a class they would just come over to me and say you know, I wouldn't wipe my ass with this. This is so terrible. And here's everything wrong with it. And, it. and they would just rip into you. And I would spend countless all nighters just up constantly getting adjusted to reading sheet music, sight reading, understanding movable dough, let alone actually perfecting and constantly refining my, my craft as an artist because my voice teacher was also very strict. And the, just the standards that they held you to, I'm looking back on it in retrospect is such a blessing. But at the time, it felt like such a curse because I felt like I wasn't actually making progress from all the weight of the stress that I was experiencing. Yeah. But the moment that I graduated <clears throat> and stepped out into the field, I actually looked at all of the skills that I developed and realized, like, I thought that I would have to be deadlifting 225 when I'm lifting these five pound weights now and <laughs> and then i'm just moving uh through company after company each one getting progressively bigger um and and it it was an incredible experience having people who genuinely believe in you kind of foist and impose their strict regiment because they genuinely want to see you improve and i think that that's a really beautiful thing honestly yeah it's it's great it's great for the people who can who can take it and run with it yeah you know which is not everyone <laughs> um also academia there are so many problems with opera and how it's trained in academia yeah and i agree there's a there's a major problem with who can be a voice teacher for young opera singers yeah oh I yeah mean, there are and some of the most highbrow pompous people are in academia who didn't have a shred of a career yeah doing yeah. anything they got their undergrad degree in in music ed and now they're teaching young opera singers and they're like this and i'm like you haven't done shit yeah <laughs> like my, you know i it's actually all over the place. i actually had to take a uh voice lessons from outside teachers uh teachers that i actually really respected because they had such a strong career because the just the teachers at the university some of them were just, I just couldn't get any sense of you're qualified to actually teach me or st structure my voice. Yeah. And you don't need a career to be a good voice teacher. Mm -hmm. um, a great example. And also great teacher, great singers don't always make great teachers. I've experienced mm -hmm. both of these throughout my career. Yeah. I'll talk about the teacher who didn't have a, a huge career, but was is one of the great teachers. His name's Bill Schumann. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's the guy that taught. Angela Mead and Fabiano, oh, and wow. Stephen Costello okay. and Brian Hemel mm -hmm. and all these absolute superstars that are that are singing at all the major opera houses. Now, he's he's a teacher at ABA. That's how I that's how I worked with him. Mm -hmm. But he never had a big career as a tenor. But he's just he just understands the voice. He how to, he understands how to polish a voice and get people singing at the world's highest level. That's beautiful. And there are other examples where people have had huge careers, but they don't know how to teach a young singer because mm -hmm. their technique is and their voice is so mature and their artistry is so mature. They don't know how to break it down into little bite sized segments. It's just like, hey, sound like this. And then you try <laughs> to do that as a freshman <laughs> and you can't do it. And so you swallow your tongue and you blow your voice out. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've definitely struggled with uh, the Kermit the Frog syndrome, too, where you just have so much space just lodged every, in the back of your throat. And... Every every low-voiced male young singer has that problem. <laughs> I, I've actually one? experienced, not just personally, but have seen every baritone under vocalist experience that as well. So I, I think yeah. you're right on that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely.
<clears throat> so, uh, kind of derailing a little bit from music, and you you were mentioning sports before, but you know what else? Like, what else really interests you? Like, what what drives you outside of music, and how do you kind of maintain a certain level of well roundedness just as a person without music just being the all consuming quality of your life? Yeah, great question. Work work life balance. <clears throat> um, it's really a, I mean, it's really amazing because I do like <laughs> I have a lot going on in music. It's shocking that there's a second for anything else. It's Honestly, like the yeah. professional opera track, the YouTube channel that's doing really well, mm -hmm. the podcast, the bass gang, my own music, which I'm still <laughs> producing. Um, <laughs> but I would say fitness and nutrition is my biggest hobby. Mm -hmm outside of music um i very regularly am in the gym doing full resistance training is my favorite form of fitness yeah. if i get cardio training um i would love to do it playing a sport any I particular so, sport um i mean pretty much pretty much anything to, if, if i'm doing it for the purpose of cardio mm -hmm. like pick up soccer pick up basketball mm -hmm. hiking even golf, if you're out there for four hours, that's actually, you burn a ton of calories just playing golf, believe okay. it or not. Um, but I'll also do, if I'm if I'm really trying to up my cardio or like get really, really exotically lean, do like high intensity interval training like I did when I was running track. Right on. Um, but mainly, I mean, my main source of fitness for sure is resistance training. Mm -hmm. So I've got my nutrition dialed and I'll dial it differently if I'm trying to lose a little bit of fat or maintain for four to five days a week in the gym still workouts are shorter than they used to be but still lifting a lot but that's probably my biggest hobby outside of music i do also love tv shows love watching movies and lastly i will i always read fantasy before going to bed <laughs> so what what kind of uh tv shows movies fantasy books do you do yeah. you enjoy like what 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 do you get out of them i get a lot of inspiration from characters i'm the same in, way in, yeah. in shows and movies i mean that's why i showed you this tattoo earlier i've got the avatar tattoo and i have another tattoo which is a combination of uh game of thrones and lord of the rings that's awesome um those are some of my favorite shows for sure by mm -hmm. the way game of thrones avatar the last airbender Peaky Blinders, Black Sails. I love big, badass, epic stuff <laughs> when I'm watching big, dramatic stuff. Yeah, yeah. I do dial it back once in a while, once in a while, and I'll put on The Office or something. Mm -hmm. Just so funny. Um, <laughs> or like a Rick and Morty or something like that. But most of the time, I like watching big, epic, dramatic stuff. Absolutely. Um, all those all those kinds of shows yeah. and movies. I find that there's a lot of really, like, as someone who has, or rather takes a lot of inspiration from specific characters, like, there's a show called Vinland Saga, which just talks about uh, Vikings, essentially the story of a particular Viking, um, and his journey through ultimately becoming a very strong and very good man raised in a very horrifying environment. Mm. Um, and shows like Avatar The Last Airbender, which is my favorite all-time animated show. Um, but just ultimately being able to take a lot of the different themes and lessons and incorporate them into my personality, understand that this person has gone through an exceptionally hard trial and these are the these are the decisions they made. <laughs> this is the result that it ended with. And if I were to meet that person for the first time, would I judge them or would I view them as they are the result of all of these experiences ultimately trying to do the right thing and and it's given me a much broader perspective as to how to engage with others and become a better person uh yeah and in this day and age where I see so many people being very critical of others especially in a in a time where I see many people more imposing their own 
let's say, political correctness onto others. Um, <laughs> I find it... I find it really meaningful to be able to kind of become a third party observer in yourself, be able to, and that's why one of my biggest goals is to travel the world and experience other people, other cultures, see how they engage with the world, whether it's community based, culture based on an individualistic scale or whatever it is. And, uh, just ultimately trying to become a better person because, uh, not to say that I was really a terrible person, but I was a very mm -hmm. unaware person. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. that caused uh, a lot of problems. <laughs> um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but we're all, in life, we're all in life school. Yeah. And, you know? <laughs> and like when I was when I was looking at uh, not only to prepare for for this interview, but just to just casually because something that I personally enjoy is looking at different types of reaction contents to learn from other people in their own views of things. Um, when I was looking at you and Elizabeth uh, from the charismatic voice and <laughs> just in case, TCV, TCV, <laughs> let's go. Um, I, I found a lot of really insightful criticisms which actually mm. inspired a lot of what i do on my channel which is it, it's not just about saying wow this is what i really liked this is what i really liked it's actually taking a little bit of that personal music experience and saying this is what i liked but <laughs> these are the elements of improvement these are the elements that uh subjectively i didn't like or these are the tech technical elements that were executed not in the best way or or what, whatever the case is, and that that really pulls me in. It makes it feel much more authentic and and real, not just I trying was, to. Say, I was yeah. just gonna say, I think the authenticity is worth the blowback you get from the fans, the the mega fans of those artists that you're potentially critiquing. Because yeah, I do the same thing. It's mostly positive. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And like most. And and most of it is is very genuine. I mean, mm -hmm. like there are so many unbelievably talented people that we get to make videos for, yeah. and it's fun to listen to them and break them down and everything. I love that quality. Yeah, yeah. but like, yeah, no one's perfect. Every mm -hmm. artist makes mistakes. Every artist has flaws, whether subjective or objective, like a technical thing. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's important to point out those things once in a while. And I think there are people who really do appreciate that. Who are also thinking like, oh, I love this artist, but like, oh, that that one thing wasn't perfect, and I'm glad someone said something. Yeah, not in the mean, malicious way, just like a, here are my thoughts, you know, do with them what you will. But I think being Absolutely. authentic is incredibly important. Yeah, like and people see through bullshit very easily nowadays. Yeah, it's I've... shocking because there's so much of it out there. But <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. So, like just something I've noticed when it comes to the real super fans of some of those artists, um, like recently on the channel and progressively over the course of my channel short lived existence, like this channel has only been going for, I want to say three or four months, um, but it's been growing steadily. And I, and I contribute that to the authenticity of the channel and the idea that uh, I've been like some of the biggest points of contention on the channel were me criticizing an artist like Dimash where yeah. Uh, I, I think Dimash has a lot of really exceptional qualities and a lot of really Agreed. fun vocal styles and performance technique. And, and there's a lot of charisma and a lot of really amazing elements. And when I was starting to criticize a few of the elements that in terms of subjective choice and objective performance, uh, when I started criticizing and commenting on them, all of a sudden I started getting comments from you know i don't care what kind of musical experience you have you're wrong <laughs> and just that kind of uh subject matter and yeah uh and ultimately at the end of the day you know we're all human beings <laughs> like it the more the more you put artists on pedestals especially the greatest artists in a particular genre uh the more difficult it is to challenge or criticize their particular way of doing something even if they do make very obvious mistakes the higher the pedestal the more difficult it is to see them 
So yeah. that that's yeah. why I think just actually engaging with people <clears throat> on a humanistic level, just engaging with them in a way that's very real and uh, being able to see them just as a human being who genuinely loves performing art just as much as anybody would. And maybe not art if art isn't their thing, but just whatever it is that they connect with and just appreciating them for that way. I think that's that's a really beautiful yeah. thing. Humanity is often lost in the YouTube comment section. <laughs> and yeah. the more your channel grows, the more you'll get that. And the more some people will want to challenge you because it's growing. Yeah, but I welcome it. Makes that. Yeah. <laughs> people feel powerful to tell a big creator, you're wrong, you don't know shit. What have you done? You can't sing like this. You can't do this. You can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And often it's putting words in your mouth, right? I mean, there, there, I can't tell you at this point the number of examples of me where I've been just openly complimentary about an artist and somehow that gets misinterpreted to me shitting on them. And I'm like, I don't know where you got that. I never said that. Yeah. And here you are <laughs> in full caps in the comment section coming after me, even though you watched probably 45 seconds of the video, you know? Mm -hmm. um that's just the way it is and i have gotten much 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 better i would say really over the last year or so i really start i started doing the analysis stuff in 2021 and over the last year or so my ability to take just blatantly horribly rude comments or critiquing comments about wh who i am and what i've done and my performance practices and my artistry and all that most of that I can really let go at this point, but it's been a, it's been an evolution like the rest of it. Yeah. And just like, I have in terms of like actually making YouTube videos, you know, I'm still figuring it out as I go, but, uh, like I, I really don't have much. I have my camera and a microphone. I obviously don't have a set. <laughs> um, that's all you need right now. That's yeah. all you need to get started. Yeah, but that that's exactly it. You know, when I started in opera, I didn't really have many resources. I just, like, very similarly to you, I was imitating Gaston. I was listening to Seven Brides from Seven Brothers. I was listening to Howard Keel perform, who also has this rich baritone voice. and uh, And I was just... I was just taking it in whatever I could take at, at steps at a time. And surprisingly, the channel was growing steadily. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the more I keep engaging with this, uh, you know, I get really incredible opportunities. Like, I, when I reached out to you, I had no expectation that I would get a response. <laughs> um, but you know, here we are and I've really been enjoying this conversation. You're a really, really cool guy. And I really, really dig this. Um, it's been a good chat and it really, I haven't, uh, I haven't had a conversation yet where we really like kind of go into the opera world. Like most of this conversation has been about opera mm -hmm. and that's an unusual opportunity for me in the YouTube space. Right. Mm -hmm. If I'm working at an opera company, it's you're talking about opera but sure, yeah. <laughs> in the youtube space it's mostly contemporary stuff so it's been it's been fun to think about think about the opera world yeah more deeply absolutely um so with all of this said um you know i i really appreciate your time here you know i hope at some point we're able to chat again or just talk about whatever again more avatar maybe <laughs> uh, but but ultimately um this has been really great and very insightful and i really appreciate your time it, it honestly means a lot honestly thank you so much yeah of course thanks for having me and we'll do it again sometime and i mean if it seems like we were going in the weeds about stuff we weren't <laughs> yeah like we could really go a lot deeper about every subject yeah i we touched on hours <laughs> per subject at least <laughs> easily easily, yeah. easily. Yeah. But with all that said, uh, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. And um, and uh, yeah. And also good. Good luck with your Las Vegas opera premiere. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Yeah. Opera Las Vegas world premiere in October and then back for Aida and Boheme with Arizona Opera in the spring. Oh, and wow. then the Barbara, Barbara Seville with Druid City Opera next May. And then We'll see what the guest artist life starts to look like after that. Yeah. Uh, if 
actually, if you could just send your <laughs> your your full uh, production lineup, I'd, I'd love sketch. to be able to like if, if there's any recordings of it or anything like that, or if I'm traveling out of town, I'd love to be able to stop by and see one of those. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll let you know. Cool. Awesome. Well, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you again so much for, for joining me here. Of course. Cool. Take care. Take care. Bye, everyone.